Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful event. We are so excited that you are here for what will be a spectacular evening. Welcome to this wonderful event that celebrates Black families and Black life. And I am so excited that this event features a female activist, scholar, family advocate, and practitioner who has helped to shape who I am personally and professionally. Dr. Brissette Chapman was one of my stellar professors at Howard University School of Social Work in the doctoral program when I attended. And because of Dr. Chapman, I am where I am and I know what I know about macro practice. She taught me what I know and I am so thankful. Dr. Chapman, I need you to know that I'm still holding on to Bowman and Dill. I need you to know, Dr. Chapman, that Dr. Thorne and I have talked on several occasions about whether this was a structural frame, a human resource frame, a political frame, or symbolic frame. Dr. Chapman, you have shaped the next generation of, of macro practitioners. And so it is my delight to welcome you to Coppin State University. It's an honor for me, actually, to welcome you to Coppin State. And colleagues and friends, it is an honor for me to introduce you to our speaker for this wonderful occasion, Dr. Cheryl Brissett Chapman, and we will collectively sit at her virtual feet and learn from her about Black families. And now I wanna hand this program over to Dr. Claudia Thorne, who has also, who also has a wealth of experience in her own right as a practitioner for 40 years. She has 40 years of professional experience working in health and human service organizations at the local and at national levels. Dr. Thorne has led agencies. She served on a number of boards and considers herself to be a lifelong learner. She is also a graduate from Howard University who sat at the feet and learned from our speaker tonight, Dr. Brissett, Dr. Cheryl Brissett Chapman. And so, Dr. Thorne, it's an honor for me to now turn the mic over to you. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the evening. Well, thank you, Dr. Stennis. Thank you so much. Um, everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome to our legacy celebration, our Black History Month celebration. But as we know, Black history is a life, a way of life for us. Um, it has been a, indeed a very rich month celebrating our legacy, our strengths, our gifts, and our talents. As you all know, Africans were taken involuntarily from Africa and brought to the Americas, including the United States, the Caribbean, Central, and South America. We were enslaved. We were not slaves. In our minds, in our hearts and in our spirits, we have always been free. Across generations, across 400 years. Yes, we have experienced challenge and we have been challenged by the structural and institutional racism. However, I'm not gonna go into that because tonight is a night of celebration. We still strive we thrive and we rise. I've heard it said that they tried to bury us, but they did not know that we were seeds. We have roots, we grow, we blossom, and we bear fruit. Today, our esteemed speaker, Dr. Cheryl Brissett Chapman, will speak about the Black family in ways that will stimulate your mind and will nurture your spirit. You will have many questions, and I invite you to post your questions in the chat box. We will proceed as follows. Dr. Chapman will speak for 45 minutes, and then we'll have a period of question and answer. The title of this conversation tonight is Recapturing the Joy, the Joy of the Black Family a courageous celebration of diversity, identity, and mastery. It is indeed my honor to introduce my colleague, 
Dr. Cheryl Brissett Chapman. I am honored to call her my colleague, master teacher, and a friend. You tonight, Coppin State University, will have a wonderful experience. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Chapman. She is a passionate advocate internationally recognized as an expert in child and family welfare. She has served as executive director of the National Center for Children and Families since 1991, leading the provision of comprehensive and model services to, through 21 evidence informed program to over 50,000 children, youth and families in the national capital region. She has served as a professor at Howard University, where she has taught child welfare to over 800 graduate students. She publishes and presents nationally on a wide range of topics, including juvenile justice, systems reform, poverty and homelessness, childhood trauma, um, domestic violence, cultural competency and ethics. She's the lead editor for an NASW press book. Dr. Chapman received her BA degree from Brown University, where she's now on the trustee board. She obtained her MSW from the University of Connecticut and later completed a master in policy, at a doctorate in education, administration and planning and social policy at Howard University. I have lots of pages to introduce Dr. Chapman, but let me let you have the experience of Dr. Chapman in this presentation tonight. Dr. Chapman. Well, I'm very honored to be here. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm very honored to be here and rather humbled because you all are my colleagues, my peeps from this region and um, to be given such accolade is really kind of just made me nervous. <laughs> and that was good to you introduce me. Uh, I wanted to, in fact, I, as you talked and did your poetic quotation, you triggered me, Claudia, and that's how we are as people, right? We're very interpersonal culturally. Our cultural strength is our interpersonal connectivity, our community orientation, our strength in coming together and moving through be it from south to north, be it across the transatlantic slave travel, whatever, being with each other. And you triggered me, sister. I was thinking about Toni Morrison, and there's only two black women that I have um, been mistaken for. Uh, one is um, Angela Davis. Back when I was 19, I had my big fro and coming to Atlanta airport and they were looking for her to FBI because she was in deep trouble. Uh, and they thought, you know, I guess they didn't recognize that all of us do not really look alike. And they thought that I was her and they held me up for about two or three hours because they didn't believe I went to Brown. I couldn't afford to go to Howard. So I went to a school that paid my way. And the other person was Toni Morrison who got an honorary a doctorate from Brown. When I was uh, actively in the trustee board and in our big brown robes, they thought that I looked like her. And so I love Tony, Tony, Maya, and uh, Angela. And Tony said recently in, in, her, in her writings, she said, they do not love your neck. They do not love your neck. You must love your neck. And so my presentation to you guys today is something that I'm just struggling with. What is this whole idea about loving your neck as a black person, loving your family, loving your community? I just uh, transitioned my mom in uh, September at age 90, and I now join all of my black peers who have let go of their mother. And the primacy of the black mother in the family structure is really dauntingly personal as you look back and smile. So let me go to my presentation and let me take you through. I want to start with just uh, sharing a little insight about what I really do because I think as social workers, when you do your passion, you do your life work. And when you do your life work, you make a difference. Um, so let me go to that. Let me pull this up. Because I'm going to challenge us to um, 
think about think about joy in the season of volatility how do we recapture the joy of the black family is this not a kind of paradoxical arrogant cocky orientation that there is reason to celebrate no matter what is that not a value that should be in our very loins that we have a reason to celebrate our differences who we are and what we've accomplished and what we've mastered uh, this is a season of trauma informed right this is a season of uh, uh, disparities this is a season of we're not okay the season of crisis and death and violence and loss but it's always been that season don't you think so let me talk to you about what my mission has been and what i've worked on why i've been where i am for almost 30 years i came out of working at children's national medical center for 10 years as associate director of child protection so i've seen kids dead on arrival and kids who've been eaten alive and kids all over the world uh, before that i worked with kids who killed out of new york state as one of the few women machismo's system of juvenile delivery. Uh, and why did I end up in this former orphanage in um, Maryland, in Bethesda, but found it in the district, an orphanage? What is our mission? Why am I stuck there? Because this is, this is really capturing my whole orientation toward children and families. As a black child of a black family from a black community in Roxbury, Massachusetts, born in the South though, and leaving to go north in the great second migration to create total healthy living environments for vulnerable children, youth, and families, and the quality of life which empowers their ability to thrive and demonstrate responsibility. That's a, that's a very interesting um, a mission because I think that's what we should do institutionally. That's what I think we should do as a society. I think we should do that with some justice. Our vision is just that where children, youth, and families live in sustained, supportive communities, which reinforce the integrity and unity of their family. So last year, we served almost 43,537 totally, and they were mostly children, adults, and you can see the numbers there, families. Our staff are now, we're about approximately at 300 now, Our volunteers are over 2,000, we've got 21 programs. But the vision, is not to do manifest destiny or to be big or an empire it's really to be a model to build confidence in the community's ability to take care of its own uh, to take care of its own we have four-pronged approach community supports education and training volunteerism and social advocacy um i want to talk around family services because this is the theme the black family probably about 75% of all the families that we serve and our model are black uh, in DC and Prince George's County and Montgomery County uh, in this region. And you can see that we have different models. Um, we have emergency shelter, short-term family housing programs. Um, the Green Tree Shelter was one of the initial models in the country, actually. It's been written up by NIDA and uh, Children's Defense Fund because we believe in not making it a warehouse, but helping the parents learn to parent, learn to parent within their cultural framework, learn to become more economic sufficient, learn to provide the basics for their children and have their confidence and their pride. Traditional housing programs, the base house one and two, these are undocumented immigrant women who are running from do, um, domestic violence uh, in cultural communities who often reject them. And in cultural communities where the, the violence that they experience can lead to their death even more rapidly than in our culture. Future bound, the independent transition, and then we have permanent housing programs. But I want to say to you, this number is growing. We just added another program, Emanuel House, where we've um, helped a landlord let three families uh, do shared housing, uh, almost like a cooperative housing model, because they can't afford to live in Montgomery County on their own, but they don't want to be dependent on abusive relationships. So this is one thing, and, and I just want to give you a quick review, because again, these are mostly black families who struggle with no safe, stable housing, 
insufficient education, they're under or unemployed, and act with supports a lack of food, guilt, shame, and overwhelming is often overlooked as a characteristic. Who feels good about not being able to deliver their child basic food, clothing, and shelter? That is fundamental to the human condition and to building a nest for those that you brought into the world. The anger and depression, recovery from their own traumas, survivorship, distress and betrayal, the stigma and the stereotypes, developmental delays for their children and for themselves because they can't grow in a developmental way in terms of workforce participation or achievement, mental health issues, medical issues, intergenerational poverty, having never seen enough food, having never felt comfortable or safe that you can wake up the next day and still have your shelter intact. Single parity, most of them, parental history of child maltreatment. We do foster care and adoption, and I'm not going to stay focused on that, except that this is about, we, we um, I was just starting our second five-year contract with the District of Columbia. I was there all day in their hearings, oversight hearings with um, Chairwoman Nadeau, um, so that we have half of all the children in the district that are removed and placed in care. And about 35% to 37% of those children are placed in um, relative care in Maryland. So these are children, about 400, 350 um, children who are placed in Maryland in care because the district does not have the capacity, even as they change your designs and are doing much more prevention and upfront work. But this is what we're suggesting. We're suggesting that every child needs the safety, well-being in a permanent family. But we have to help parents, fostering relative and birth parents, to be able to ensure that they have that attachment. And that's the big agenda for us. Allison Services, that's the origins of our orphanage. Um, these are young males. We have a lot of young males and other adolescents, black males, predominantly in our care who feel the intense impact of abandonment, rejection, abuse, and neglect, and struggle with trust, struggle with trust. And you know, there's research out there that says, Search Institute, if you don't have two or three adults that are not your parents that you can trust, you can't really grow into a maximum healthy adulthood. Committed and compassionate professionals who can set those examples, and they are trauma-informed. They do understand where these young people have been but they teach essential life skills. As one young man in our study said, you know, we could have used a lot less about our feelings, a lot more about what we're going to do when we leave here and how we're going to do it. As he went off and got an award the next year because he moved on with $10,000 in the bank, a subsidized apartment in Glen Burnie, and his job working the seafood spot in the giant that he transferred to. So he understood that adulthood is about taking care of yourself and about your economic viability. But I think the most important thing that we learn in focusing on uh, these adolescents, and we have a couple hundred of them in our care, is they need the opportunity to tell the truth. Like the Jewish Holocaust scholars have taught me, the truth, we have to tell the truth. Stand over that Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem for the first time with only one other black colleague with me and we held each other. We didn't know each other before the journey. We held each other because we understood what evil was for the first time. Not sin, not wrongdoing. We answered evil and we understood that slavery was an evil thing. And we felt it in our belly and our guts. As a German tour guide spoke to their, her, her tour, tourists about that the Jews built this so that they would not forget. And because I had four years of butchered German, I was able to protest nada so for Kessen, nine for Kessen. And then I got adopted by my Jewish colleague. But it's the same thing for our journey, that no one forgets the evil betrayal. And because we have to tell the truth, and that's what we seem to be in the mode for truth telling now, we seem to be in that mode. I still challenge that. And we'll talk about that perhaps if you want to. But the second part is unless you tell the truth, you can't forgive the folk who hurt you. And you can't forgive yourself. Um, DeGru Leary talks about the post-traumatic slave syndrome and the sentence of shadow slavery and how the self-esteem is so corrupted and corroded and so under assault 
and the ever-present anger and the racist socialization, how we play out the non-truth, the untruth, the, the narratives we say now, the mythology I say always, but we have to do that to become productive. So impact, impact. I mean, this is real. When you look into the eyes of these are young people that are in our care, this is their art. And they were able to present their art into a packed room of 500 people. And they were able to bid, ask for them to bid. Oh, I asked for them to bid. They just held up their art and grinned. This one in the middle, every time it went up, another hundred dollars he almost started jumping into a jig he was so excited that his work was valued his expression his internal expression he is now in boot camp in the marines an impact this is a a, a librarian um young man whose mother died his father brought him to this country and when he wouldn't drop out of school at 16 put him out the house and he was homeless impact we took him into a homeless program where all we really did is give him an apartment and helped him go to school because we gave him food and some clothing and shelter. He ended up getting a full scholarship to GW. We helped him look like the other three engineering students when he went to school. And he is now working for NASA on that telescope in the space. All right, impact. Poverty is the enemy. We're in the community too. We're in Ward 7. Ward 8 and community-based services, we talk about poverty being the worst thing that can happen to children. This is all going to set you up for my, my argumentation, my case building today about how we approach the Black family with joy. Poverty, it, 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 it talks about fairness, equity, inclusiveness, protects childhood. And how do we collaborate with community partners to help poor children and youth become achieving scholars and envision a quality of life for themselves? You'll hear me say later on that we annihilate the black family by annihilating the black boy the first day he walks into a classroom at the age of five at the age of five we go after him and it doesn't necessarily mean and folk who have been taught by me and how it knows that you know i know overseers too doesn't mean it's cultural matching doesn't mean that that boy will not be under assault or not protected and we address the basics it's not just about psychotherapy or even preaching although spirituality is still important even if the church may wane and flow with black family we do more than just give them some professional paradigm we feed them we go physical we go emotional we go spiritual but always celebrating their lives all right because that's key always celebrating their lives uh, this is a police officer that adopted 40 of our families and fed them uh, during this virus season, fed them every single day, 40 of them, and two of them were beat up on Capitol Hill. Nice guys who joined the force to do this kind of to help the community and who were so uh, stereotyped themselves. Um, but impact is having kids understand that we must discriminate against people, not just stereotype them because we need each other. And the last thing I want to talk about that we do, we partnership with 10 regional school districts. And these are, we have MOUs, we, we, we bring them um, clothing, food, dental, visual uniforms, all kinds of things you can see here. Um, because we want those young people, 40,000 of them we serve, we want those young people to have a shot at not being distracted by the shoes that don't fit or the teeth that hurt or the eyes that can't see, who can't afford the $600 or $900 cell phone, who sometimes come to school every other day because they got to wash their clothes and share it with their siblings, who hide their food so they can bring some home to their siblings or to their parent. Um, we have gotten all kinds of folks to give us funding direct private donation There's no government money in this because our argument is how can you have so much and not give something to a kid sitting next to your kid who's in need and people understand that this money all goes to this kid where there's no management fee impact this is the bottom line of family family for me and i've had people say well that's kind of hokey and maybe this joy thing you're going to find it's kind of hokey too because my argument is this 
what's the point of being a child? You can be happy. Look at these faces. Is that the point? Because you know what? Once you become an adult, it's too late to make such expectation upon everyone. Albert Ellis, the rational motor theorist said basically, whoever promised you a rose garden and what kind of irrational belief that you think because you're born that you're going to have someone love you. And I'm saying it, it may be irrational, but it's a good irrationality to work toward that children. Look at this face. Why shouldn't she have a moment in her life of just being sure happy and not have to worry about adult issues so she can be creative, she can envision, she can move into that tightrope called life where she has to let go of childhood and begin to manage her own impulses and, and understand that there are consequences to choices she makes. So here's my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening to me talk to you about kind of like what I'm into. This is kind of like, that's one of my babies that I'm into and there are other things that I am into, but that's my baby, this mission that gravitates all of these young professionals in the community to really understand that we are responsible to help families and children and youth to do this, to, to go through life with some quality of deliverables. I mean, what, what else could be more important? But now let me frame the Black family in my, my commentary to you today. The Black family, I'm going to suggest to you that the Black family is an economic phenomenon that the black family, the blacks, Dr. Thorne, that you talked about in the beginning, that we were enslaved, we aren't slaves. Well, we were viewed as slaves. We were viewed as property. And I'm going to be provocative. I'm going to suggest to you that when we got emancipated, when we got, was fired. Did I say that? We got fired. And though some of us were killed, some of us were killed from being incorrigible, having too much warrior spirit uh, in us and not understanding the shadow role we played. Um, property, um, um, the, the uh, plantation owners were, their wealth was a direct correlation to how many slaves they own. All right, so we were property. We had some value, but once we emancipated, what did we become? An economic threat. I have an uncle who was lynched in Virginia and everyone says he committed suicide. We all know what happened to him though. And our family. We became an economic threat in the incarcerations, the chain gang, the Ku Klux Klan, all oh, the death threats, the deaths. And I already talked to you about that economic threat shows up still. So Byron Allen, who's a very interesting personality in our society, a black man who was born to a 16 year old, almost 17 year old mama who went out and somehow found himself in LA and found, found himself suing some people, find himself a comedian, find himself at 10 selling, uh, pulling carts back to get little sticky so he could get a dollar's worth of food to feed his mama. That Byron Allen, who's wealthy, he talked about his adoring his mother. He thought she was brilliant, went to school when he went to school. He talked about the four point program, she said. In slavery, check. Stop Jim Crow, mm, achieve civil rights, uh, and ultimately achieve economic inclusion. Bottom line is economic inclusion. All right, and he talked about the schoolroom. What happens in the schoolroom for black folk? Because remember, the black family is containing this raising the child and taking care of the elderly. So what happens in the schoolroom where you get your educational tools? What about the boardroom where you get capital? What about the courtroom where you get redress, where your rights are redressed? But remember what Martin Luther King said, Jr. He said there are two Americas and we can't, we can't survive, we can't exist with two Americas. But what's the point of sitting at a, uh, uh, what do you, one of those, what do you call those restaurants? What's, what's the point of sitting there and protesting the, the right to, to be served when you don't have any money? And when he brought up this major idea around the economy of this thing, they killed him. So let me move on because I still have some thoughts. So I thought about this. So let, I'm not going to do the 400 years 
of slavery and uh, reparations and how recovery. I'm going to go straight to the economic focus. Can I do that? Uh, let's look at the residential segregation and let's look at the role of federal housing policy. Some of you social workers, well, in fact, all of you social workers shouldn't understand that macro policy is just as important as micro intervention. They're all tightly intersected. So let's look at this one from why do you have your black client, your black family living in a deteriorated neighborhood with no resources and barely any public services at all? And you've got to go into that community. You've got to make sure your car's not taken and you've got to make sure you're safe. You've got to make sure you don't take any roaches out when you leave. And you got to make sure that the baby that lives there, the landlord's put enough heat in the house so that child won't get sick and die of pneumonia. And then the landlord never gets charged with neglect. Just the mama, maybe. So how does that happen? How do we, how does that, what's that got to do with macro policy around, for example, federal housing policy. This is about residential segregation. So structural discrimination occurs when two or more groups live in an urban area, but not in proximity of each other. And there's this theory called social structures of accumulation, SSA theory, that talks about the impact of sustained and dramatic changes in public policy in response to major economic crises. And so there's an article that just came out uh, recently that I, um, yeah, very recently, Ab Abramowitz and Smith, that talks about, they compared the liberal phases, 1940, I was born in 49, so I, I can relate to what was going on in this era, 1940 to 1975, with policies that came out, they call it neoliberal conservative policies that came out post-1970. And the policies of the Keynesians were like expand, expand the welfare state, drop, drive down some resources, give away money, build government, however you want to frame it, versus contract the welfare state, do reform on welfare, give less, cap this, don't do that. Um, it goes on to talk about the Great Depression and the increased role of government. But the second economic crisis that we had after in the, what, in the 80s, the second economic crisis, and free market, small government, fiscal austerity, individualism, that's what we did with that. And where are we now? Are we talking about authoritarianism today? I don't know what we're dealing with now because the GOP is very, very recalcitrant about moving off of anything but authoritarianism. authoritarianism. And we could call it the Proud Boys or whatever you want to call it. What do you want to call it? But it's really about who controls the country's resources and what is this thing called democracy and that is the big debate so i want to look at the two great black migration i'm just using this as an example residential segregation so 1.5 million blacks left the south all right so we we passed now we're past with jim crow now we're past slavery and left the brutalities that they've experienced in the south seeking world war one employment Okay, that's what they were doing. In the 40s to the 1970, you had the next big wave and the largest internal movement ever in the United States. Four million blacks left the South. Nearly half of the 22 million blacks in the country were living now outside the South. And then you had the urban spaces reorganized around racial lines. You had hyper-segregation in Detroit, St. Louis, Manhattan, Philadelphia, Kansas City, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, the big, the big cities. And they moved from whichever southern state, they moved right up the line. And here's what they found, that in that liberal period, the Keynesian period, the segregation um, index showed that it was even, it was higher than it was. Um, before it went above uh, the 60 point index to high segregation. But look down here at 1970-2010. And we talked about in this in this literature, they talk up they talk about a black isolation index. And it went over 70 points and 40 year average of 66 was seven percent higher than the earlier era. All right. So what are the policies that drove this stuff? 
All right, social workers, you think about how do you critique, unload, advocate for, or participate in, or collude with, or don't understand. The New Deal, the New Deal was about redistributing the income downward, and it was high federal taxes, uh, but even then, more spending, but even then, there was uneven outcomes, and no impact on segregation. Then we had the mortgage insurance. We had the federalization of regulatory powers the housing policies that were racially separate and unequal despite some civil rights success. FHA required redlining. They required the races to be separated. Federal spending on public housing was viewed as unfair market competition. White flight, black steer into poor neighborhoods, lower taxes to increase profitable growth and downsize the role of government began to be the next set of policies. Cut social spending, reprivatize more, increasing private lenders. And we know what they did to black folks migrating out to Prince George's County, the black new Mecca. We know what they did to them around lending. Fannie Mae was virtually a monopoly over secondary mar mar mortgage market, deregulation and racialization of lending, charging high interest rate, denial uh, for blacks and rejection for refinancing, still going on devolution, shifting costs, and responsibility to state and local block grants. Housing gaps are still in high levels of residential segregation has persisted. It's persisted since way back in 1940 from this study, unequal access to increased home ownership occurring before 1970. All right, the home ownership was increasing, but it was still unequal for blacks. They wasn't, it wasn't increasing for blacks. Not at the same rate, overt discrimination ended in the late 1960s. So the symbolic frame, Dr. Thorne, Dr. Stennis, the symbolic frame, it looks symbolic to me, but the stereotypes still prevail and the barriers were the same. So now I want to conclude with the implications because now we have folks saying that there's been a decline in racial segregation, uh, residential segregation, but maybe it was due to the end of the Great Migration the black middle class moving to white neighborhoods, folk going back south, gentrification with people integrating because they're coming in to take over these poor housing structures that are cheaper and they can fix. The immigrant groups that are coming to the neighborhoods are, re are, are reducing the isolation. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is we're still living in a racially residential segregated fashion. So let me just go through a few other things that we may want to think about. This is the black family. You're saying, well, wow, this doesn't sound joyful. But remember what I suggested to you. You have to tell the truth and look at it hard with some evidence. Even if that evidence is historical and anecdotal, it's still a truthful storytelling. You have to do that before you can move on and forgive. And forgive it, forgiving is the freeing process not being drugged into that is who you are, just a disparity, just another traumatic mess, all right? You're not okay. I had someone say, we should have a summit on we're not okay. So I'm not coming to that summit. <laughs> What's that gonna do for me? Black unemployment is consistently almost double white unemployment. Over time, look at the time. Racial unemployment gaps are widest for employees without college degrees. We see that, we understand that. All right, but it's still different with those with college. So you can see here that blacks are 3% and whites are 2%. It's 2019. Racial pay gaps are the widest. I want you to hear this. The widest for employees with college degrees. Now, everybody's not naive and you don't have to be college educated to have some intelligence. And it does say, well, you know what? working for college education where I become a contemporary sharecropper because here's the game with sharecroppers. Remember, I don't know, I, see, I came out the South. My, my grandfather left some land to a little bit of land to my family, but there were a lot of sharecroppers and it was something like this. You would work to try to get enough money to pay back the owner so you can own the property of sharecropping. But guess what? You never made enough to pay him back and then you got the interest the interest keeps growing and you never get to own it. You never get to leave your children nothing and it goes on and on. It, that's what it's like when you take out so many loans 
and you are looking at this, you're not going to make the money to pay them back. So you could be dragging out a loan and paying out interest or creating other debt for yourself to survive. Black and white high school dropout rates are falling and converging. That doesn't seem to be dramatic, except remember what the early charts say, that the same kind of education doesn't create the same kind of income. And black folk are going to college, so the stereotype that we're not going to school is not true. Racial wealth disparities increase with education. Um, but look at this, look over to the right. Did you see that? Did you see that discrepancy? Mm, that that the more educated you become, the more of a disparity you have with racial wealth. Now, I've had folk, uh, some of my colleagues at Howard, you know, in line for graduation where you would be talking, and uh, you know, I'd be saying, we, we do financial literacy with our people. And I had an economics professor say, they don't have anything to be financially literate about. And I was like, what? My mama told me if you got a dollar, you can save a nickel of it. <laughs> and he said, really? Suppose you have nothing, you don't have enough to eat. So look at this, this next uh, slide. White families own nearly 10 times the wealth of black families. See, this, see, see where we are over here in the blue? Hmm. Black families and far less than white families and all families nationwide. We see this, see where we are in the blue? Black poverty rate. Now, now this gets to really hurt my heart because we know from the national, uh, from a, a Blue Ribbon Commission report in 1980 where all the big shot researchers got together and, and summarized everything we knew about childhood. And what we knew was that poverty is the worst offense on childhood, more than physical abuse, more than, um, mental health and physical disabilities, more than a, a unsupportive community, more than family instability, poverty hurts our children. I've done some study on that in Montgomery County and done some writing and did get some county funding. So we do take care of, we now have about 25, under 25 year old, no, no, maybe about 30 now, under 25 year old homeless um, parents with their children that we get funding for. We just got uh, two and a half million dollars from Jeff Bezos day one fund that we're going to give the families, these young parents, we're asking what do you need to be able to get to a permanent housing situation? What do you need? And whatever they ask for six months rent, a car, I don't care. Give them what they ask for because it's better than what we doing with uh, government case management interventions. <laughs> All right, because their children are paying for them being poor. Their children are poorer and they're younger and the impact on their brain development is no joke. Look at the black home ownership rate has not risen about 50% when two, three quarters of all white folk own their homes. All right, black workers remain more likely to be unionized, but the, you know, the unions are in trouble period, but we have used the unions to keep our little bit of income and a little bit of entitlement. So now I'm beginning to wind down here and get to the, the, my, my point. Uh, some other factors are incarceration rates for black Americans are declining, but blacks are still six times more likely to be in prison as, as, as white folk are. Um, the progress in closing the black white life expectancy gap stalled during the 2010s. You can see we're here. Uh, it began to uh, stall. But let me just tell you, COVID is going to take us down again. We already have seen studies recently that the black life expectancy is already a couple of years um, less decreased already just in this year of COVID. And one year, we're looking at enormous pregnancy-related mortality, infant mortality rates remain higher. Again, look at black folk, our, our, our pregnancy deaths and our infant deaths are still there. Yes. People die, black people die, black women die having babies, and black babies are dying at twice the rate. Uninsured gap. Uh, you can see that there is a coverage gap in this red. You can look at the 9% to 16%. 
non elite by race. And so here's what I want to begin to conclude now and open it up to you for your consideration and discussion. I think we have to go beyond trauma informed and finding everything that's wrong. And there's so much wrong, it's been wrong for so long, and it's economic that we need to get beyond that to capture joy. I think joy helps with the heart, helps with stress reduction, helps, helps with health, helps with connectedness, helps with just making life tolerable. People are thrust into unfamiliar roles to fulfill difficult tasks. And small mistakes can become a crisis and have lasting impact. Being stopped and getting out the car and making the wrong move can kill you. A small move. I don't know what was going on with Tiger, but whatever the, the mistake was, it has a lasting impact possibly, although he's a miracle man. Sense making is what I'd like to suggest to you. It's about contextual rationality and is built out of vague questions, muddy answers, and negotiated agreements that attempted to that attempt to reduce the confusion. It is not really quite compatible with a case plan or with the DSM diagnosis that often reflects such inadequate knowledge of the psycho, psychosocial, biopsychosocial journey of the individual. Um, and yet we can be so confident around these thresholds we think defines their potential or lack thereof. This requires emotional intelligence. And you know, Goldman's work and this other folk that have done work on EQ awareness of self and of others, the ability to collaborate into teamwork, to get over stuff and to present yourself again, to be vulnerable to being wrong, to be a nosy social workers and admit that you are, because that's what excites me about being one. It is also fueled by a recognition that making sense propels our decisions, including our inquiry and our advocacy. We have to do inquiry. We have to ask because we don't know inform not knowing we have to advocate and express what we think but then we might be wrong or we might not win and that's all part of maturity that you understand this is how life rolls you don't always win at it in fact the harvard model in counseling and consulting psychology and that's where i went dr um thorn i went to harvard and i couldn't get into that program because it was the most popular program in the country because they don't use a deficit model. Their, their theorem is this, that if you're alive, life will jam you up enough that you're gonna need professional consultation just because of life. You don't have to have any pathology, life. And one of the things about life is uncertainty is the core feature of disasters, similar to what happens to black families, always experiencing compounded stressful circumstances, currently and historically, intergenerationally. It is, it is hard to make common sense when each person in the relationship is, sees something quite different. And what is the one thing we must make sense of to save our very lives? Cornel West said that, and I don't always agree with him, but he is brilliant. He says, it, existential death is when there is no hope, love, joy, or meaning. He says, hope, love, purpose, and meaning. I put in joy because it's joy to feeling that you are supposed to be here and that you are of some intrinsic value and worth. There's some joy in knowing that life can be better, life can, or, that, or that you've made life better for someone else. So here are the, the, the techniques. I'm suggesting that leaders today have to point the way to safety and influence help cultivate resiliency in black families. And that that they that the black families have to be capable of these four things: the ability to improvise, remain creative under pressure, bringing order out of chaos. Look, my grandmother knew how to take the hog, the hog that we fed slop buckets to, and take that hog and cook everything but the oil. Let me be real clear: her cooking was so good, the white folk wanted to come over and get some of it, bring her stuff to cook. She could improvise with black bullets. Um, these these berries that you would never eat or hard rock things. She would make them into jam, put them inside a yeast bread and cook them. And you didn't even know you didn't have any meat for dinner that night. That's how good the food was. 
improvisation. I'm using that in a food out illustration to be, that's all she had was what she was growing and her cow and her chickens and her hogs. That's all she had. But what she did with it, what she did with it, she drove her family, grew her family, and she produced great grandchildren who were physicians and lawyers and uh, deans at, at black colleges in the South. That all came out that little black woman being imp improvising around how to feed her children when her husband, a preacher's kid, was running around having affairs and didn't bring no money home to her. And she was abandoned in a heartless marriage. But she did good and went to go to school. At, uh, at, after he died at 60 something, she went back to school and finished high school. And then now there's a senior citizen center named after her down in um, Columbia, South Carolina. Wisdom. Knowing that knowledge and ignorance grow together. It's knowing what you know, what you know, what you know, but also knowing that you don't know. And then how do you deal with that ignorance? And how do you look and seek where your ignorance is? And how do you figure out what to do with it rather than it be internalized as something contemptuous or something that will demoralize you? It will help you figure out how to figure it out. Respectful interaction, that's trust, honesty, and respecting the reports of others and your own beliefs. How do black families begin to see that they can trust each other even as they see each other's limitations or vulnerabilities? That's what makes family. Family is a place where everybody knows what you can do, what you can't do, and what you messed up on and don't care because they respect you anyway. They love you anyway. You're part of us. You're one of us. Communication um non-stop talk when there's no talking you can't get through the disasters i'm beginning to wind down here the sense making process speaks with perspectives the need for interpretation techniques and in analyzing how the family in this case organization of family is functioning sense making is where the action and the tragedy live the real action occurs long before decisions ever become visible before we make a decision about when we decide to talk to our son or our daughter about what you do when you walk out the door, you've already made sense of what that context means for their lives. And by the time you figure out when you should have that conversation, I'm gonna use something very basic. The sense-making process have already determined its outcome. And in order to inspire joy in Black families, You've got to initiate tailored culturally competent engagement strategies to serve as resilient sources of collective sense making. So when someone asked me, and this is my last slide, when someone asked me, well, we we if we'd gone up on the Capitol Hill and if we had if we had done that, what would have happened to us? And then a whole lot of a whole lot of um non-black folks were really talking about that. And I told one non-black person in my shop, I said, well, you know, that wouldn't even happen. I don't know why you talk about that. And, and they looked past, I said, because black people are not that stupid. We would not go up there and act crazy, carry weapons and pooping all over a building we built. What's the point? And then shut that conversation down. All right. So the piece is what makes sense? Why are we having some of the conversations we're having that have absolutely no currency for empowering nobody who's black? But I think in my conclusion is that social workers, your challenge, and you know what? You, you already know that I'm teaching you what I'm trying to learn, that improvisation piece. So you have to figure this thing out in a collective, creative, sense-making way. How do we celebrate the battle? We are in battle, but we've always been in battle. Black Lives Matter, affordable housing and ownership, elimination of poverty, civil rights and diversity, improved well-being and health, safe streets reduction of racial wealth gap, community building, political empowerment. We've always been in battle. How do we find a way to celebrate that we're still at it? Toni Morrison said, you know they hate your neck. You have to love your neck. And there's joy in being able to do that. And social workers, I think, that our real agenda is to help our black families and our black community find the joy.
Dr. Chapman, thank you so very much for such a very stimulating discussion with the research, with the evidence-based practice, with the impact on the Black family across time. Um, very stimulating and really shifting the paradigm from solving and fixing the problem to creating joy and being creative. That's a beautiful thing. Um, right now we have one question here. And the question so far is, when you talked about Jim Crow and the status of an economic threat, the question is, was Jim Crow created because they knew we were resourceful? Oh, you've got some smart students. I am, and being self-aware, I am the child of Jim Crow. Remember Jim Crow was after World War um, II. Jim Crow was running around World War II. My daddy came back, he had joined the Navy at 16 to send money back to lied about his age to send money back. When he got out of the Navy with his medal and went to look for jobs in the South, as soon as they got to him in the line, the first black face, they shut the door. That's Jim Crow. Jim Crow is economic. Kill him, lock him up, put him in the chain gang, put him in prison where they'll work for 10 cents to do the license plates straight up economic threat. It wasn't really about them caring about our black skin because you remember slavery, they were making babies with us against our will and sometimes not, if we told the truth, right? Because that's how, you know, I live in Dakar, Gory Island. My kids say to me, Ma, stop. We don't want to go with you over there because every time I go over to the island, I get mad all over again, jump up and down. Right? <laughs> um, because there were women who had babies because the masses with the sale, the traders would let them stay on Gory Island. And you just see these beautiful African women and their children that came out of that journey. But most of us were taken against our will to have children. So we were property. We were Thomas Jefferson. We were intimate members of the household, even when we were field Negroes. But after we were emancipated, we began to have a whole nother set of problems because we had all these codes that came into place. And we were, uh, we were killed. We were killed. So it was economic threat. And look, when you look at the data, I don't mean to say anything, but did you not look at that racial wealth data? I'll be honest with you and I'll say this to you because my father, you, know, you have to know who your, what your people left you. My, my people left hard work. My daddy left work. He was not a happy person in the sense of he worked two or three jobs. He did not ban his kids, but he was a miserable somebody. We had to all work because he had to work, 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 work. And I have that work ethic from him and I have forgiven him from the pain of having it imposed on me. But I think the bottom line is he worked three jobs just to keep this little old raggedy hustle falling apart. That, it was, that was sold to by Jewish families. They moved out to the suburbs and the house really should have been torn down and not fixed up because that's all he did was work for his house and it made him unhappy. We couldn't have fun. We couldn't enjoy life, all right? So we get the leftovers or nothing. That's economic. So you go north thinking that there's gonna be the abolitionist overlay of we like black people. No, no. And the place that it showed up most was in jobs and residential segregation. Everybody in Roxbury, we had everybody from Ed Brook lived behind me. Ed Brook, that they romanticize now as the Black Republican. He lived behind me, but across the street was a foster home. Down the street was a family of 10 and the father was an alcoholic with no job. I mean, we all lived together because we were segregated. So, so, so that Jim Crow period, and we're still kind of got one foot in that. So got one foot in, and it's economic. We make it all about uh, love and hate and black and our color and all that straight up economic. These are folks whose journeys to this country are journeys that come from being put out of Europe, having no land in Europe, avoiding being locked up in Europe. They're coming here. And when they say we want our country back, 
They came in and bullied the indigenous people who said the land belongs to the creator. Why are you going to put a deed? We don't do deeds. And I know I've been out there. They're still fighting the federal government, some of the nations. All right, and so this is about possession of this land economically. And we, and we, and we get distracted with all kinds of stuff. And mostly we get distracted on how we treat each other. Hmm. Because if we made sense together, I mean, and I'll be honest with you, can I say this? I think it's the social worker's role because social work is social work is a collective practice profession, isn't it? Yes. And we have done advocacy in the past. So how will we do? But we were not black as a profession. Nobody wants to talk about that either. But I've been in those delegations where we used to do them physically. And we were really, really uh, invested in the um, uh, LGBTQ agenda, which was fine with me. But then we got rid of the poverty agenda, which was coded for race. And we just dropped the ball like a hot potato. And then we had the black social workers talking about interracial um, adoption when very few white people want any black kids. But we were we made that a whole agenda. And I'm saying, what about the black people who have the black kids? What is that agenda? We can, we've been fragmented with distracting conversations. So I think that's Jim Crow effect. Mm -hmm. And Byron Allen, who is a millionaire billionaire, can look at it so clearly because he got through the distractions to be economic. And he said this. It's in the classroom for the black boy when he walks to the door. Someone said, aren't you going to get blackballed for talking about the raising these issues and suing people? He said, I was blackballed when I was born. Now, I never thought I would be quoting the comedian, but the comedian's observations are just as interesting to me as any academic. Because the academic is only confirming what he's been saying. In the boardroom is the capital. We don't know how to do capital. We don't know how to do. We don't know how to invest in each other's businesses. We use our own money and go broke, <laughs> right? We don't do capital, and we really don't even know how to do the court system. Really, that's why I'm writing with this, and it's the hardest chapter. I've got a young JD from Howard to help me with it. He's the lead author because I'm not stupid. He's got the JD, but we're talking about a protected class for black male minor children who've been taken from their birth families and put into public systems. I want that to be a protected class. And I'm going to figure out how we can make a case for it. We are working on it because that group is not all black boys. But when you look at the black family, if the boy is taken from the black family, from the birth family, and it might be because they couldn't manage it or whatever reason, who teaches him how to survive? <laughs> That's the role of the black family. Who teaches them how to survive? Because the systems cannot do it. It's it's a conflict of interest for them to do it. Because they're in the economic game too. Devaluing the body, the black body, this boy's black body. And in, in the moment he says something at 10 with a little deep voice coming in, then he gets crushed by people who are also black who are representing the systemic stuff. As Angela Davis said recently, when we invited her to speak, she was powerful. She said, look at yourself and the systems you're in. Look at yourself and the systems you're in. Social workers, you got to do that. That's EQ for black social workers. <laughs> or for social workers who work with black families. Look at Absolutely. yourself. Absolutely. Essential. Or you should just go sell computers, really, because you are doing harm. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chapman. We have two additional questions, very thoughtful, thought provoking questions. Um, Justin Eastman wants to know what is the biggest problem between black families and why do you think so many African American men decide to drop out of school? If you were to look at socialization of gender 
across all cultures. This distinction between the male and the female, would you not say? Yes. And a lot of that, it doesn't mean that it's absolute. But when I hear black women say, well, I had to be the father and the mother, and I say, hey, you couldn't be the father. You need to just tell the truth. You could get a father, you could do what fathers have to do, but you can't be the father. You're the mother. In the socialization of the mother and the father, or the male and the female, there is a biological component it's called estrogen and testosterone. And the testosterone is the aggressive hormone and the estrogen is the nesting hormone, right? So it's the male's instinct to look at whether or not this behavior is going to bring back, is going to give me any meat to bring back home. Now, I just showed you all that the statistics don't confirm that going to school is necessarily econom economically viable. Now, you may say, well, it can be, but at what cost at him becoming neutered? Can I go there? Can I go there? Does it come at the cost of him repressing his instinct? Can I go there? Who is standing in front of him and being his teacher? Can I go there? I had a colleague, a judge whose name will remain unknown, and I met him in the, out, downtown somewhere. He, I used to be on a board with him, and he, he and I both agreed to get off the board because it was kind of like too much for us and our schedules. So I hadn't seen him before. I said, hey, judge, what you been doing? How are you being a classical social? I want to know all this business. What you been doing? This man is well married, good kids, well respected in the community, good guy. He said, oh, we started a, um, a, a few of us, we got together and we started a um, Rice of Passage program group for these black boys. I said, oh, really? I said, so what you learned doing that? And he got real quiet. He said, I knew you'd ask me something like that. And he got thoughtful. He said, what I learned well, before we met with the boys, we met with each other. And what we talked about is how we have sacrificed our lives to be successful and how we have had moments of homicide that we've had to eat so that we could continue to earn a living for our families. Homicidal rage and that we had never told anyone that and it was the first time that we all shared that about each other because we were in a safe place. Do you understand it? So how do, how do you how do you expect the black male to go to classical universities and colleges? The role of the historical black college is so powerfully important because of that. But even then, what what is the messaging? So you so you know, I think that whoever asks asked that question, your answer is probably just as good as mine. Just as good as mine. I think this is something that we all have to contemplate. But I also know we have the other side of the story, which is that we say all the time that, that we have more black men in jail than college, and that's not true statistically. So we also perpetuate a perception of low expectation that black males don't like to go to school and aren't going to go to school. And black male children see themselves as, that's not what I'm supposed to do. My sister is the one that's going to go to college. <laughs> that's not what I do. And so you get to what's the messaging to? And it doesn't mean the parents messaging, but we know we have community influence. It could be that someone in their network, their adult, the person they trust, is messaging it. Now, if you go back to the residential segregation piece, you know that they're going to be likely to be in neighborhoods with a 95% rate where there is kind of collective depression about the black male who's so hyper stereotyped. Hyper, hyper stereotyped. And so they then reinforce each other. So it ain't cool to go to school. And that becomes a peer-driven belief system. And it is normal for, for adolescents to be peer-driven. So you can't punish them for that. But then how do you infiltrate that self-perception when everybody around them is saying, Obama ain't real. He's not born here. He shouldn't be the president. So you can't even say, we got some black folks saying he shouldn't have been the president and he can't do diddly. And so what is the imagery? What is the hope, love, purpose, joy? We take that away from the black male. And black people do it sometimes when we fight over things that don't matter. 
driven by this historical truth that it's an economic fight for survival. Okay, Dr. Chapman, wow. It's an economic fight for survival. It comes down to um, uh, the economics. It comes down to the economics. We have one more question. And this question is about joy. And the question is, talk about the black joy in the blues Saturday night and the gospel music on Sunday morning. Black folks found ways to be happy despite the misery. And I wanna add something to that. How do social workers take care of ourselves so we can bring joy? Oh, that's a good point. Yes. Because you can't give something you ain't got. You can't share something you don't experience. And so it is fundamentally essential for the social worker to find that place in their life that they're joyful. And I'll be honest with you, if you've spent your life trying to be successful or to be validated, to be an achiever, I'm an achiever, so I know this, but then we have other motivations besides achievement. Some of us are motivated by wanting to be loved by everybody. And some of us are motivated by wanting to have some sense of power and control. And you know what? We're no different than the folks we serve. If we came out of alcoholic family system, we're going to want some power and control because we never saw nothing in order. If we are parentified and we're the firstborn and the firstborns and we've been told you're the black girl, you're supposed to take care of your brother and everybody else in the family, we're going to want to achieve and work and build and make things happen. If you have come from a situation where, and this is, this is what we all know, social, we all had um, human development, right? Um, family and child development. If you come from a situation where you never felt the love, it wasn't never enough, you're hungry for it, you're gonna be looking for that. Now, all three of those irrational motivations have to be managed. So we talk about the physician heal himself. Well, I'll say social worker. Get a grip, okay? We're the most powerful oriented people in the planet. The doctors will tell you, there's a book called Better, a surgeon even wrote it, a surgeon wrote it, this then. Um, we'll tell you our purpose is to prevent disease, heal disease, and help you be comfortable when you die. And the most important characteristic is to have the character to admit failure. So they go into the rooms and shut the door without us in it and talk about how they killed the patient or missed the mark so they could be, quote, better. Lawyers, they try to make a case to get you money, get you off the hook, get you out of jail, shorten your sentence, get someone else on the hook, make them pay. They tell stories and they make, t make pictures based on what you need them to do. Based on the story you need, what, what you wanna win. These are very limited goals. What does a social worker do? The educator has a, 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 a curriculum and she's got, or he's got a pedagogy that he wants to implement. There's a few adult trainers that understand it's gotta be what the person wants to learn, but that's not for children, allegedly. And so I get very limited. What do social workers say? Now you all can challenge this because I'm real open to being pushed back against. I want you to think about it for yourself. What do social workers do? We think that if we engage a person, anything might happen that's good. That's power. You think you're that important? That your engagement of a family system of a child or a youth system uh, of a senior person, you think that your engagement should make a difference that you can match, match, um, a measure? I just came from a hearing all day today and I had this, I heard this woman say, well, we should make the kids use these resources before they leave the system. They're 21, 22, and then they come back, they didn't use the system, we should make them. And then you want to blame, and we should measure whether the program worked because they wouldn't do it. I'm like saying, where do these power imagery comes from? 
because the power imagery in social work is denied, minimized because we're nice people. But no, we're power people. We want to be able to fix it, make it matter, do something different, do change. But the change has to begin with us. So how do you change so that you really do wake up in the morning joyful? Because I'm going to tell you from my experience, because my staff send me the most difficult clients that they can't handle, and then they want to watch the staff and handle them in the interview, right? And guess what my constant technique is? It's my constant technique is to look back and to lay back in my chair, look them in their face and say, wow, <laughs> you're pretty angry. You want to talk, talk to me about it? Because here's what I know looking at you. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want your child. And I admire a mama that will fight for her child. <laughs> I admire that. So you're going to fight for your child and I'm going to give you the opportunity to fight for your child. So let's talk. And what you, they respond to, every one of the response to me, giving them the respect that they have something that they're bringing to the table that's wonderful. And whether you, and I don't even want to hear the staff say, well, she got an attitude, she fight with this, that, and yeah. Then the kid, she comes to the, the visitation and tell the kid, you're dirty and you lied on me and I'm sick of this. And, then I, and, then, and I said, this is all, that sounds great. But really, what are you going to do with that? What we're doing with this is that she wants her kid. And she probably will not get her kid back, maybe because of other behavioral issues. She won't go get drug treatment. She won't do therapy or whatever. But can you revalue her for wanting her kid? And I'd be meaning that. I'd be saying, hey, that's a good thing. And I am happy for her that she still has in her. I've seen the crack heads who didn't want their kid. But I've seen the heroin addicts who did. So I know you can't lump people in boxes. You have to always find something about them that you can you can celebrate and acknowledge is a good thing. Every single person, and that's as good as it gets. Fine, it, doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that. All these menus of techniques and people write up stuff. They don't even know how to write up stuff anymore because it's the same old stuff. They can't even get original anymore. It's about the, your, your giftedness is in your ability to see people and see them and celebrate them and find joy. Even if they're lying on the street cussing you out. That's the, what makes us special. The doctors understand what they do. The lawyers understand what they do. The educators understand what they do. But wh what do we understand? And I'm just saying that that's the most powerful question I've been asked, whoever asked it for a long time. It's about you have to find your joy. You have to forgive yourself. You have to look at the consequences. This anxiety disorder movement that we have going on. See, I've lived through borderline. I've lived through bipolar. I mean, I lived through these trendy diagnoses. The latest one is anxiety disorder. You know what I call anxiety disorder? You know what I call anxi anxiety because you know I can tear up these some anxiety disorder is this. When a person does not want to acknowledge that they have the freedom to take responsibility for the choices they've made. Wow. They won't, so that, that everything else is the problem. Well, you're going to be anxious as hell if everybody else is the problem or if everything else is a problem or if the fact that we have irrationally been treated as economic threat and targeted for destruction because our utility is over, our utility is over, that's irrational. But it's real. And you know what? We have to be careful when we get preoccupied with that irrationality because we're going to be anxious. And what will happen to our health? What will happen to our body? What will happen to the opportunity that when we are left out of the hospital, I've gone through this, and your mama dies in the hospital bed, you can't go in, and you're so upset with the hospital, you've been fighting with them, you got to see her at, a, at six o'clock that night, but 11 o'clock, when you thought she was going into hospice, she is now left in a room by herself and dies by herself because of hospital policy, because they can't figure out how you can have a compassionate visit and make and help me move my mom out the hospital. And so I have got to manage the fact that I'm responsible for my decision about what to do with that, what to do with that experience in order for me to maintain the joy I had that at six o'clock that night, she squeezed my hand, 
so she couldn't talk anymore. And I want to remember the hand that squeezed me and the love and what we went through. I don't want to remember hating that young nurse who didn't know what the hell he was doing, who then, when he called me, and I thought my mother was being picked up by the ambulance to take, because I couldn't go there because of the COVID policy. When he called me within 15 minutes of our conversation, he says, what's your funeral home? And I thought about so many patients, so many clients, so many black people, that they get that kind of incompetent insistence that he gets a right to be incompetent. And I'm saying to you, be careful that you're not one of those people. Well, your incompetence comes out of your need to be loved, be in control, be responsible and perfect. That's irrational. And you'll end up with anxiety disorders you don't even know you have. And then you'll end up needing medication, you'll self-medicate. You'll do food, drugs, whatever, relationships, whatever. You'll do all kinds of stuff because we're human and it's fundamentally not superior to who we serve. So. I think joy is so powerful that if you have it, you can affect people with it because you can look at them and say, wow. And my last story, because you know that question is so profound. That's a whole, um, um, Claudia, you could do a whole article on that, that question. Let's do it. <laughs> you know, here's the deal. Cause so, so let me give you my scenario going back to the black family. This is my conclusion here now. So this black woman came out of New Jersey with her, her little girl and ended up in our homeless shelter. She was an accountant, has an associate degree or something, an accountant, whatever. Very obese. When I say obese, 400 pound obese, not, not just regular black obese. <laughs> you know, regular morbidity around 300, 250 pounds. She's bigger, big woman. And she came and she was in the shelter when about three or four months she moved into rapid rehousing transitional housing i showed you that little chart and that's a two-year program and whenever the family come close to maybe a month or two months before the the time is over this is my social orientation i told my staff don't be bringing people to me when you're kicking them out what the heck am i gonna do with that and i don't want to be in that bring them to me when they're moving to a place where they're struggling and we see that so this is the meeting around you're struggling. You know, there's only a couple more months left. What's going on? Which is about getting a job and then being able to afford her own apartment. And she had a part-time job, but she couldn't get another job. You know, her obesity probably would threaten any employee to be afraid of you know, medical bills just alone. So she was challenged. So she's in my office by herself with the two, the nice case manager and a nice social worker. And they're all, there to have the meeting with Dr. Chapman about what we're going to do with you in two months, right? And she's sitting and I'm looking at her. And I said, so let's talk about what's going on. And she talked about it. She talked about how her daughter had gotten a full scholarship to Princeton. And I sat there and I said, whoa, you're a good mom. You did that? My staff's looking at me like, what's she doing? Because I meant it. You got a full scholarship to Princeton. I wish I had produced, I produced one, but I needed two more to produce. You produced this child in a homeless situation? She got a full scholarship. And she, she looked and she put her head down and started crying. She said, I don't feel like a good mother. I'm homeless and look what I've drug her through. And I said, what? And I went for my heart. I said, you got to be kidding. You need to be jumping up and down celebrating because that's what I'm going to do. This is a good thing. And I said, what is your concern? She doesn't even have a computer to take to school. I said, done. That's no problem. What, 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 what? What happened is this girl had a tooth that had never been pulled down. So she'd gone all the way through school with two gaps in the middle of her teeth. So she never smiled. So we got the laptop. And I said, you know, you all got me stuff. You got me all in this now. So now I'm all in the joy of this, this scene. So we're going to have to give her the laptop in my office, OK? And she came over with her mama. And she was holding on. And then we gave her the laptop. And she broke up to this gorgeous smile with this big old gap. And again, I looked at her like, whoa. And then I said to her right there, I said, 
she got down on the no no she was smiling over the laptop then i said to her would you like an appointment with my dentist and see what we could do around your because you're going to be going to school in august so we need to get you ready for that. We need to do something with your teeth. Is that okay? She got down on the floor of my office and wept. Do you understand me about joy? And then I had my assistant call my doctor and I said, hey, we need to do some pro bono in here. Okay, I'll, I'll do some of this, but can you pro bono? Because she needs orthodontic work and nobody pays for that. He said, okay, you got a deal. And she has the most beautiful mouth and she's at Harvard Medical School now. Do you know what my point I'm saying is? Because she did not know how drop dead gorgeous she was. She did get molested at Princeton. We had to work through that because she didn't have the steam of her physicality. Her mom didn't model it. She had the gap, but I went for the joy. I went for joy and, and, and I still do. They sent me an invitation to graduate for the graduation. I didn't know who she was. It was left on my desk. And I said to her, we got to make it up. And so we make up stuff. We have fun. She sends me great messages. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Joy. It's about joy. Joy. It's about finding opportunity. Okay, we can get a laptop. Okay, we get your teeth thick. Okay, guess what the end of the story is? So mama, we hired her to be the residential assistant at the same shelter. And then we promoted her later on to be the manager, but because she had a job with us, she could move into our affordable housing program that we had built in downtown Bethesda as a resident manager. So for $700 a month, she had a two bedroom apartment with $2,500 a month. She had her job, her little job up the street at the shelter and her daughter could live and come back from Princeton to a nice apartment and they could heal. Amazing. And all of that was about looking for the opportunity to be joyful about something. I didn't get into her obesity, her depression, her need for medication, her need to go work out. I didn't get into none of that. Let her doctor deal with her weight thing, but she's not gonna go to a doctor if she's depressed. She won't be depressed if she's feeling like there's some hope here. And here's the real deal. She felt that she was special because I was the executive director and I loved her little girl. Her little girl's my girl because she got on the floor and cried about having her teeth fixed. <laughs> that she suffered you know what she suffered having a big old gap in her front of her teeth and being smart too. She was in the corner just doing her work. So that's joy. Joy is the technique. Find it. Recapture it. Because it, be it the sweet potato pie they mama made whenever they were unhappy about a boyfriend. Find the joy, find something in their world that they can share with you joyfully. And remember, no matter how bad things are, it could be worse. And the joy may come from, that's what the strengths-based model is that I don't see social is using. The strengths-based model is not doing a checklist around what they got going for them. The strengths-based model says, and I've said that, you know what? And I said to her, you know how much worse this scene would have been, but what did you do? What did you do, honey? What did you do? And he said, well, I did. I said, so you just to use those same abilities for this situation. That's all strength-based means is how do you help them discover their strength that they own, that they, they tell you they share because they don't see the judgment. They don't see your technique. They definitely don't see your L-I-C-S-W because no one cares about that, okay? Except Howard, maybe or the licensing board, and they see you seeing them as someone deserving of joy. And when they see it, and it's in the gut of your eyes and your nonverbal and your body, when they see it and feel, I do it on the Zoom. They feel on the Zoom. I get them on the Zoom to call me back. One mother called back after she cussed up my staff, whatever. And she birthed me, she called me, she said, you know what? I call you because you like Oprah. I said, Oprah, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't have Oprah's money. She laughed. She said, but you, you, you understand 
that I, I need to visit my child. You you got it. That's all this is about. <laughs> all right. I don't know what the other people try to do. And then her child had been given a legal guardian and she was not going to get her child back. But she's not going to abandon her child. And my thing is, that's a good thing. One mother said, you offended me because you were asking all these questions. I said, I'm trying to find out if you're real. She said, oh, oh, I said, you are real. And so your child's fortunate to have you. It's just also being accountable and joy. You let people hold you accountable to being positive. So you got to make sure you let people say, you know what? You know, you can't do this thing from a negativistic perspective, from a diagnostic, from a disparity, from a deficit, from a what didn't happen. And even trauma is getting bored to me because that's like the new trendy baloney. Because <laughs> all trauma informed means is that you have the ability to create a trusted relationship with somebody else. So they'll tell you their secrets one day when they're ready to. Clinical defense, disassociate until you can handle it. I think that's healthy. <laughs> right? I think it's healthy. Disconnect till you can handle it, till you're in a situation where you can cope with the truth. And the trauma informed perspectives that you're able to build that relationship so that they might begin to ease it out. And you may begin to figure out how to do joy. I, I got the adolescent story. She had been sexually abused by so many people. She's coming to see me every week and she's talking about how she feels damaged and this and the other. I had a vase I brought from Williamsburg Pottery. Beautiful, beautiful purple vase in my office that I got for like $10. I was so happy that it looked like it was worth $5,000. I paid 10, I couldn't see straight. So I had it up on my top of my chair, my desk. And I had knocked it over and, and it got cracked. It was so beautiful that I just used super glue and put it back together. So I remember when she was doing her depressed thing about how I'm so damaged. I took that vase. I said, I said, child, what are you talking about? Here, look at this vase. She looked, I said, do you see the crack in it? She looked at you. She said, yeah, kind of a little bit there. I said, yeah. But don't you think it's still a beautiful vase? She said, I said, that's like you. It's still beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I showed her that. And I value this vase. And I don't want to ever have it fall again. If it did, I'll glue it back together again. It's, don't you think it's beautiful? And she, she said, it is beautiful. I said, that's you. You get this little tiny crack that gives you character. And it makes you actually more valuable to me. I look forward to talking to you as you work through recognizing who you are and how you should be so happy being who you are. Because you could be someone else and look at how you're made. You're made so that the fracture doesn't even show because you're strong and beautiful. So I think that that, that that that's what joy is for me. So it's a it's a mantra. It's a way to communicate and connect to people. Um, and I think black the black family needs that infusion. I, I think they need that. And I think that they're the culture, our culture has a, a, an aptitude for doing that. That's why we will go to church and we'll do online with the church in home. That's the one I do. Because what we respond to from a spiritual base is this idea that God loves us and we are valued and that we will get through it all with God, with grace. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's kind of a cultural strength of our community. But some of us, the church has waned and some of us don't understand that principle. But you could just bring it by the way you walk into their life. So I had a lot of anxiety doing this um, lecture, um, Claudia, because um, I always like to teach something I'm trying to learn. And I'm coming out of um, burying a 90-year-old mother that I was, was working on keep until she was 100. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that I did for her house next door was to have a red door painted on it. And then she was gone. And she was with me 12 years. We brought her husband, my father, Parkinson's disease. I watched him and I went to the VA system. And I'm just saying to you that at this point in my journey, I needed to be reminded of what it's all about again because you come through the pain, 
reformed and better and better. Cheryl, profound gratitude, respect, and joy. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your very enlightening conversation. Thank you. Dr. Bolden's going to close us out. Dr. Um, Chapman, I did not have the privilege of having you as my doctoral um, professor. I, I met you when I was in the master's program. Right? So I, I can't remember why it is I met you, but I remember meeting you and, and having um, an extensive conversation with you. And as I sat here this evening, I felt like if I was back in school in some ways. Okay? And in some ways I felt a little cheated that I didn't have you in my doctoral program, although I, I am a bison like my two colleagues who um, spoke, but I finished at the University of Pittsburgh and you were not there, so I still feel a little cheated. You said a lot and if I was to asks myself, what can I say about you and your presentation today? All I can say is, wow. And I would like to, I think it may be still appropriate, but I'm sure you would accept it with, in the spirit in which is, is said, my condolences as you continue to fi find joy um, as you continue working through your grief. Thank you for being our Black History and Pre-Social Work Month speaker. There are several nuggets you left with us and you did a good job in, in bringing some closure to things, so I would not spend a lot of time um, talking about uh, seeking to bring closure to your presentation, but I will highlight some of the um, nuggets, some of those um, wisdom points that resonated with me um, so powerfully, only a few. The first thing that you said that I be, I firmly believe and it is something that I internalize is the importance of telling the truth and that unless you tell the truth, you cannot forgive the folks who hurt you. And I know that sometimes for fear of how one might be classified, we sometimes remain silent when we should be vocal. And so we carry around with us that continued hatred that weighs us down. You reminded us in, in no uncertain terms that <coughs> the black fa family is an economic phenomenon. And that for me um, helps to make sense of the reality that during times of economic um, difficulties that racism is heightened and there's there are lots of data that validates that. You presented the challenge that I might end up writing about um, in a different way than I think Claudia may, right, um, that Dr. Thorne may, right, is the, um, the challenge to recapture the joy, right? Mm -hmm. And I may find myself using that title through my poetic lenses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was very provocative, and I'm sure Dr. Thorne would agree with this. When you said that wisdom is knowing that knowledge and ignorance grow together, <laughs> we usually focus on wisdom as being the knowledge part, but we don't always um, re um, focus on the fact that ignorance is also growing at that time, and that helps put a lot of what we are experiencing now in context. But I like the question, and I think Dr. Um, Thorne highlighted it as well, is how do you find the joy in this economic fight? 
for survival. And this is something that, like you, we need to continue pondering over. I am glad that we ha have recorded this session and that this session would be made, the recording of this session would be made available to the larger community besides the social work community. And I know as uh, probably an extra credit or regular assignment, I will probably have my students dissect what you just said because you took us <laughs> and you gave us a lot of points that we need to drill down on. So thank you for um, being a part of a month that has been very provocative with a variety of different um, presentations. Thank you for capping it off in such a provocative way and giving us food for thought so that we can remember that we are students of life as we continue to search the truth, even as we become seasoned academicians and seasoned practitioners. Thank you for being authentic in your delivery. Um, thank you for being authentic on a whole. And so on behalf of the African American History Month Committee at Coppin, on behalf of the Department of Social Work, on behalf of all who have the privilege of hearing you this evening, I would like to say thank you and may the Creator continue to richly um, bless you in ways that you have not even experienced as yet. Dr. Thorne, thank you for um, doing a wonderful job in um, moderating um, this session. Thank you, Dr. Stennis, for opening up, creating the uh, landscape of joy with your, your excitement and, and preparing the audience to know that um, someone who helped shape who you are was going to de be delivering a message in a powerful way that will continue to resonate with us beyond tonight. There's no more that needs to be said, but thank you for coming our way. And we hope this, I think this is the first, but I hope that this will not be the last time when the Coppin family will have the privilege of your tutelage. Again, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you too, Kelly. Thank you. I'm very moved. I will have sent. Will you already have the copy of the PowerPoint that you want have access to? You want to use it? So I have my references on the PowerPoint. Would you yes. like to have that? Do you want me to send it to you? Yes, thank or you. Or do you already have it, Kelly? OK. All right. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bolin. Your remarks are just very powerful and affirming. And you know, this is the kind of field we're all in. I always say that if you do nothing, pat yourself on the back because no one else may. <laughs> but it's so joyful to be affirmed by a student, Kesslyn, that I don't even know she remembered me. She was so young and so focused. And Claudia is my peer. She's been my, my sister girl. And Dr. Thorne, I watched her do the nonprofit executive dance and all of that and go through her, her doctorate. Um, but you, sir, represent kind of, um, for me, the little black boy going in that classroom. And the power of um, the black male's assertion of his right to be economic so that he is an umbrella for his family. So you symbolize that for me and I am affirmed by your remarks and your kind, kind feedback to me. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>